we're going to go ahead and get started. It's noon right now. Um, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you all so much for coming out today for the Montana Institute on Interstitial Seminar. I'm very excited about today's seminar. Um, featuring a host of different speakers uh, talking about climate resilient communities. And so we'll have two in person and then two actually presenting remotely, um, just so you know. And then the only other kind of small detail before I turn over to Paul is we're gonna hold all questions until the very end. Again, just to make sure everyone has time to present. Um, we'll have QA at that point, and I'll just make a note, there are microphones on each of the benches. I'll reiterate that, but um, turn those on when you're asking questions. But go ahead and get this started. So thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. And um, we're gonna try to um, allow plenty of time for questions at the end, because I think there's gonna be a lot of great information um, that we really wanna get your feedback and also um, provide opportunities for questions. So um, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. Let me just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Paul LaChapelle. I'm a professor in political science and I'm funded through Extension. I'm the community development specialist working across the state. Um, I'm gonna let my colleagues introduce themselves um, when they speak in this order. Uh, and we're going alphabetically, uh, Bozeman, Missoula, and Whitefish. So you'll hear about those three communities um, and the resiliency planning that they've actually um, have been in, engaged in and, and um, are, are moving forward on. So um, just, I'll talk to you briefly about some of the work that I'm doing. Uh, for the last six years or so, I've been involved in uh, climate outreach work as part of my extension appointment. And um, one of those um, projects has been this 4-H Weather and Climate Youth Learning Lab. And we got funding from the USDA Climate Hub office that's based in Fort Collins uh, to develop this, uh, this learning lab. Um, we worked with partners in four states and this has now been accepted as a national 4-H curriculum uh, for grades three through five. So we're really excited about that and that this will be available free of charge uh, for, uh, for youth uh, across the country. And I'll be speaking tomorrow, as a matter of fact, at the Montana Science Teachers Association annual meeting to try to engage uh, science teachers uh, to incorporate this, uh, these materials into their uh, curricula as well. Uh, also just recently published uh, earlier this year, this edited book, uh, 18 chapters with 42 uh, authors, contributing authors, uh, with my colleague Don Albrecht from Utah State University. So um, it's available on Routledge, uh, look for it on Amazon. So I uh, won't go into too much detail, but with, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, information out there about the uh, impacts on, specifically on communities, communities of place, we'll talk about right now, um, uh, and uh, the, the challenges that they'll face uh, in, the, in the coming decades. The U.S. Global uh, uh, Change Research Program um, states that this, will challenge, this issue will challenge the ability of society and natural systems to adapt. Uh, diseases and conditions will worsen, according to NIH. Um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency says, says that vulnerable areas uh, and the poor, young, old, and sick are going to be the most uh, susceptible. Oxfam says that the, uh, the impacts are going to be overwhelmingly negative. And the Stern Review, which many see as one of the most comprehensive um, assessments of the economics of climate change, it says that the, it says similarly that the poorest countries and people will suffer earliest and most. Um, again, lots of data out there. This from the um, National Climate Assessment in 2014, looking at all those vulnerable populations from the, um, the aging populations across the United States and here in Montana to increasing asthma rates, uh, chronic respiratory disease deaths, obesity rates, di uh, diagnosed diabetes and poverty, all of these populations now are more susceptible, more vulnerable to uh, the impacts of, of climate change. Um, we've seen issues, uh, or we've seen information rather coming out from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, talking about the impacts as well. And they've got a ton of information available about um, from um, allergens to vectors to air pollution to extreme heat and, and um, uh, what those impacts are going to look like and uh, what the responses potentially could be. So as a result of, of these, uh, these potential impacts and, and facing communities, um, we, uh, a number of us got together, and you'll hear from my colleagues in just a minute, uh, to form this very informal group now, Climate Smart Montana, kind of based on the, uh, the, the, the name uh, that was started in Missoula, which you'll hear about in just a minute, Climate Smart Missoula. 
Uh, but we formed this, you can see the website, and you can see who all the partners are that are involved in this at the, the top of the screen. Um, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit network with the goal of sharing information and resources to better coordinate community-based climate solutions and resiliency efforts in Montana. So we're just trying to collect and distribute the most relevant climate science materials. We're sharing best practices and, sh and highlighting success stories. We're just trying to understand local challenges, um, facilitating community efforts, identifying and ob obtaining funds, and hopefully encouraging other communities to think about this and act. So now you're gonna hear from individuals in these three communities uh, that I mentioned and um, hear about those, those resiliency planning efforts uh, in more detail. So I'll introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Natalie Meyer, who's um, the Sustainability Program Manager with the City of Bozeman. Um, and I'll advance the slides for you if you like. And, okay. Well, it's an honor to be here and thank you, Paul, for organizing Climate Smart Montana and organizing this, this workshop. Um, I'm with the City of Bozeman. I've been in this role since 2008. And um, in that time, we've developed um, a number of guiding policy documents that um, really started with our internal operations. In 2008, we adopted a, a mitigation plan that looks at things like um, fire, uh, police department operations, water, sewer, all of our internal operations and buildings. Then in 2011, we really turned to the community and partnered with organizations like MSU and developed a, a community-wide mitigation plan. How can we reduce emissions? This plan lays out a target uh, for the city of Bozeman of reducing emissions 10% below 2008 levels by 2025. And this was one of the earlier plans around the, the country and um, we've been working with it, but we'll talk more about what we're doing next. Um, then after 2017, um, NOAA declared uh, it to be the costliest year on record for natural disasters. We got a little bit more serious about adaptation and resiliency. We started again with internal operations and focused inward on what the city needs to do to prepare for climate change. That plan was completed in, in 2019. So. Um, we, we've, we've been hard at work for a number of, of years. These are just a few statistics um, that kind of indicate what we've been doing. We've focused a lot on municipal energy efficiency and conservation, um, saving minimally, these are verified savings, of $371,000. And um, to put that in terms everyone understands, that's 538 Subaru Foresters driving around <laughs> for a year. <laughs> And uh, we also have a business energy project where we partner with local small businesses primarily and help them through the energy audit process and also provide the additional incentive of up to $2,500. And through that program, uh, businesses around town are saving about $54,000 a year or equivalent to planting about 6,100 um, urban forest trees planted for 10 years. We also have a number of uh, solar PV installations around town, the most significant being the 385 kilowatt solar array um, located at our water reclamation facility, um, but funded by, by Northwestern Energy through a kind of unique partnership. Um, that's generated 1,300 megawatt hours of electricity or equivalent to burning um, 13 tankers of uh, gasoline. So this is the breakdown of Bozeman's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the, the primary sources for us are, are buildings. Commercial buildings make up 30%, residential buildings 23%, and then the other big chunk is um, vehicle transportation. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, our share of aviation at the Bozeman Airport is about 7%, and landfilled waste is 5%, and our water and wastewater treatment processes are so two tenths of a percent. I'll spend a little more time on this somewhat involved slide. Um, this is a, a snapshot from 2012 to 2016, just helping us identify the trends. Um, overall, in that period, we reduced emissions by 5%. Wild population growth um, increased by, by 20%. Job growth in the county increased by 22%. These gray bars represent residential um, emissions. 
we saw that home energy use per person went down 7%, residential emissions went down 16%, and then those orange bars represent uh, commercial emissions from buildings. Those went down 9% per job and um, overall 25%. The things underlying that, what's driving those reductions are primarily the transition from um, Northwestern Energy's electricity portfolio, transitioning from coal to hydroelectricity. And also uh, we saw a bump with the, the new adopted state energy code and also the installation of LED lighting is, is driving that, that change. Um, in transportation, this is where we have more problems. Um, emissions went up 7% per person, meaning that more people are driving on our roads from out of town. Um, transportation emissions overall went up 26% and waste emissions went up 8%. So, um, and then introducing the, the resiliency piece, we know from the, the 2017 Montana Climate Assessment, this is a very general paraphrasing, um, but we expect more days over 90 degrees, more urban flood events in Bozeman, longer and more intense drought in an already drought prone area, reduced mountain snowpack, which makes up most of Bozeman's water supply, um, and of course, more severe wildfire and more severe winter storms, which we as an organization are definitely feeling already. Um, so with that in mind, we, we partnered with some pretty fantastic organizations like NIST and um, MSU Extension and Gallatin County Emergency Management. And we, we looked at things like our hazard mitigation plan, our continuity of operations planning procedures. And we, we sat down with staff, had extensive interviews, workshops, tabletops, and we figured out what, what do we need to do to better prepare? Um, and MSU is part of that continuity of operations planning. Uh, we've, we've developed a, a framework for resiliency through that plan, um, but the, the big part of it is that we recognize that we have a role to play in educating and informing the, the public. This plan's new, so I can't talk about great successes, um, but these are the types of policies that you'll find in the plan. Um, it's about building out backup generation, increasing redundancies, um, increasing air filtration capabilities in, in key critical buildings um, in, in anticipation of more uh, smoky days. Um, for policy, getting a little bit more aggressive with water conservation and um, new developments, and also updating our, our stormwater standards to better handle urban flooding. Um, one step that the, the city has taken in recent years, um, after the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement, um, then mayor, um, then mayor, <laughs> signed on to the, the 2017 um, uh, Compact of Mayors, and we were taking this commitment pretty pretty seriously. And as we update our, our climate plan, we we have our eyes on this and how we can um, meet or exceed. This, this expectation. So this is kind of another breakdown of our, our emissions from 2008 to 2012 to 2016. Um, our baseline year was 2008, and from that time we essentially saw no increase in emissions. And this blue wedge um, represents what, what emissions would look like in a business as usual scenario. So we're, we're doing better than that, but this smaller blue wedge um, represents what we would have to do under the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and that's just accepting two degrees of uh, warming. So we know that we need to go further than that. Um, so a lot of work to do in a town that has grown 26% since 2008. Um, and, and we are reducing on a per capita basis from that time, we, we reduced emissions 22% per person. So that, that's what we're up against right now. And as we um, go ahead, look to update our, our new climate plan, it will be more comprehensive and that'll include both municipal and community emissions, but we'll also have an eye towards community resiliency 
and integrating the conversations we've already had, but bringing it to the, to the broader community. Another piece that we're really focused on at this plan is climate equity and human health and well-being. Uh, we're working really hard to come up with a diverse group of stakeholders to help us walk through that process. Um, for those of you here in Bozeman, um, we're, we're actually really kicking this off next week. We're having a visions and goals community forum at the Story Mill Community Center from 4.30 to 6.30 on Wednesday. So, and you can of course learn more about the plan at this website and my contact information is in there too. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. We'll turn uh, now to Missoula. Uh, Amy uh, Sillenberg uh, is with Climate Smart Missoula and we'll maybe just take a second to, to get her on the line and, and Amy, are you there? Can you I hear us? I am here. Can you guys hear me? We can indeed. Go ahead. Okay, great. And Thanks. just tell me when to advance your slides. Okay, I'll just do a, a next when I'm ready, but I just wanted to, yeah, thank you so much for having me, and I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. Um, it's great to follow the work of Natalie and Bozeman. It's a real inspiration what you folks are doing there. Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, today some of Missoula's efforts to create a climate resilient community. And you can hit the next slide. Um, so just a quick background, Climate Smart Missoula is a pretty new local organization. We're a nonprofit, we're about four years old. Um, the three women in the picture below our logo are the staff and we work with a lot of partners. Um, this is a picture of us with Andrew Lewin, who runs the Montana Renewable Energy Association. So we partner with a lot of um, other nonprofits and also very, work very closely with local government, both the city of Missoula and Missoula County. And next. Um, and our mission is to engage our community in climate actions, catalyzing efforts to reduce our carbon, carbon footprint and build a resilient Missoula. So we do work um, at Climate Smart on both mitigation and adaptation efforts. Uh, so the mitigation, you know, reducing our carbon footprint, we measure our greenhouse gas um, emissions here in Missoula at the community level in particular um, and work to reduce those. Um, just real quick, we were kind of lead author, authors and worked with local government to um, create this options report for how Missoula would transition to 100% clean electricity um, last fall and then over the course of last winter, um, our, both the city and the county um, passed resolutions to adopt 100% clean electricity goal by 2030. And we're sort of strong partners in that and trying to work out and right now a roadmap and figure out how we actually do that. Um, working with utility and co-ops and a whole bunch of other green building efforts and things. Um, but in the context of today's talk, I thought I'd share a little bit more about our adaptation efforts. I'm happy to answer more questions about the mitigation at, at any point after um, you know, at the end of our presentations or, or offline. But we could, uh, next slide, talk a little bit more about adaptation. It's kind of crucial to when, to how Missoula, or Climate Smart got started. Um, so again, we're about four years old and when we first started, we're, we basically came um, to be because as we, a bunch of folks in the community pulled together a community climate action plan. And one of the buckets or focal areas was a healthy Missoula. And we um, recognized that nobody in our community was really thinking strongly about how we kind of address some of the changing conditions. So this is a 2015 photo. If you're familiar with Missoula, that's Mount Sentinel and where that arrow is pointing to the M, which you can't even see because of wildfire smoke. Um, and really our strategy, but the health department would put out alerts about poor air quality, but our strategy amongst the community was really, you know, pray for rain and or leave town when the smoke got bad. And we recognized that with changing conditions due to climate, heat and wildfire smoke um, in particular, we needed to be doing more. So we got together, um, got some funding together and started a program that we end up calling Summer Smart, which you can click next slide. Um, this is just a screenshot from our website. We, we started this initiative to figure out, you know, how could we better prepare ourselves for changing summer conditions. And on our website, if you dig around, there's just a whole bunch of resources. So we created resources, we did outreach, education, workshops, um, and really thought hard about how we could get folks to think about um, planting trees for hotter days and shade and, um, you know, addressing some of the health risks that come with, with heat and also, again, focusing pretty heavily on the wildfire smoke and developing some resources to help people understand um, what to do. 
Um, at this point, we one of the things we worked with our health department, um, really thinking about, you know, the, the message that we have for folks when it is smoky is to go inside. And we did some preliminary monitoring and realized that in really smoky conditions, inside air quality can be just as bad um, as the outdoor air quality. And um, we recognize that there's a lot of people that are uh, particularly vulnerable to wildfire smoke. So next slide. Um, what we did, we started a program um, in about in 2017 to provide HAPA portable air cleaners um, to clean the indoor air of some of the folks the most vulnerable. So the top couple pictures are um, some volunteers that were helping to deliver HAPA air filters to folks that were referred to us by Meals on Wheels. Um, the low income homebound seniors with respiratory issues are particularly vulnerable. A lot of them live in sort of leaky homes, have poor air quality. And so we started a program to just give those to some to these folks so that they could breathe easier. Um, this was in 20, the beginning of 2017 when the everybody said, oh, it's gonna be a great summer. We don't really expect a lot of wildfire smoke. And then we were hit with um, what the scientists now call a flash drought it got hot and it got really dry and that's the summer where um, we had the big fire on Sealy Lake in Lolo and air quality was um, really dangerous. We ended up switching gears because we had this program up and running. We just started buying more air filters um, everywhere we could get them and giving them to both schools and also just individuals that were in desperate need. Um, so because we were thinking about climate change and we were trying to think about adaptation strategies, we had this program going and we really just um, just were able to run with it when folks were really um, in need. And it worked pretty well. So it's just a, really an example of, of what you can do if you're thinking ahead a little bit and partnering, in our case, with our health department. Um, on the lower, there's a couple of pictures of babies and kids. We've expanded that program over the last couple of years to give these air filters to daycares um, because they have a lot of, you know, children are um, extremely vulnerable and you get a lot of babies in one place, you might as well have clean air. So we continue to work on ways to prepare our community for um, these changing conditions with this Summer Smart program. Next slide. Um, and, you know, the idea, with this particular program, it was you know, really focused on some of the things that we at Climate Smart could do. And as we started to bring those forward, we realized that our you know, wildfire smoke and heat are just a, small, a few of the components and we really need to grow our efforts to be um, more adapted to the changes that we're seeing. So we sat down with a, or worked with the city of Missoula and Missoula County to develop and implement specific strategies to build local climate resilience. Um, and, and thinking not just to the city of Missoula, but our whole county, which if folks know Missoula is pretty big. Um, next slide. And when we got together, this is myself um, and Chase Jones and Diana Mineta, so two other individuals that work in local government. We um, became familiar with Climate Ready Communities um, it's a program that is, it's a whole program that's out there that folks can tap into. And what's pretty neat about it is they offer tools and a guidebook that are specific to smaller communities. Um, you know, you can read a lot about developing resiliency strategies for Boston and San Francisco and big communities with both money and also different issues than we may have. Um, this Climate Ready Communities is a guidebook that's kind of designed for folks for communities around the size of Missoula or even smaller. Um, in the middle there, you can see there's that picture in the middle is actually the guidebook and you can get that for free if anybody's interested um, in looking through this. So it's a very detailed look at what, what a community can do and they take you through and step you through the process. So we sort of joined on to, to using this as our process moving forward. Um, next slide. And what we, are going through, and I, I bring this up because it's a, it's an ongoing process right now. And um, wait, I think we might have missed. Can you slide jump one back? Ha! Huh, one of my slides went away. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so the process that we're using, and again, I'm working really closely with um, the city of Missoula and with Missoula County. And it's about a 20 month process that we're working on. We started in the, in the summer of 2018. Um, we convened a steering committee with both community members, but also with a lot of folks that work in local government. 
and we've created a climate and community primer. And I'll talk about these um, briefly, these next couple stages briefly as I go forward. Um, we identify and prioritize vulnerabilities, who and what's at risk. And then we are in this, we're right, right now in step four, develop and prioritize adaptation, adaptation strategies. And then once we have those, that works into a resiliency plan, and then we work to implement the plan. That's the big um, piece that we'll be getting to in 2020. So next slide. Um, so that's kind of our overarching process. And when we got into this, um, we really, we wanted to look very closely at what the scientists were telling us that were projections for Missoula County. So we work with a bunch of scientists at UM, um, especially with from the Montana Climate Assessment and the National Climate Assessment. And we, we really explained, I think our, our primer is like 88 pages of real detailed look at what um, is expected to happen. Um, and one thing we did with this, just to help folks get their, mind, their heads around what what kinds of changes we might expect to see is we came up with some different scenarios, plausible explanations of, of a future. And they're very different because we don't know what the future is going to hold. So this whole process we're going into, we're, we're looking at it with, you know, we, we just don't know where we're headed. Um, but these are some plausible futures. One is turn up the heat where it's hotter and drier. Another scenario that would have different implications for our community and for our county would be here comes the rain again, where it's a lot wetter, especially in the shoulder seasons. And then feast or famine, which is the idea that every year is going to be really different, even if the overall trend might be for hotter and drier in the summer, wetter around the shoulder seasons, we're going to have a lot of variation. And how do we as a community think about that and plan strategies accordingly? So that's all in our primer that we pulled together. Um, and it was very useful to setting us up for the next stage. You can click forward next. Um, oh, and yeah, I guess I'll mention there that that scenario, that last scenario where the feast or famine, it's just really difficult and something to be aware of if you're doing adaptation planning. Um, you know, you start to plan for some of the changes you expect to see, and then you have a nice summer and it's not smoky and people forget um, what's happening and you have to help the community understand that we're really thinking for the future. Um, it's kind of tricky. So clear skies or, or foggy skies, you're going to get both of them. Next slide. Um, so the first thing that once we had that primer, we had a big community workshop of over 100 people. And we brought them together and really worked in cross sector conversations around um, thinking about who and what is most at risk, given these climate projections and these scenarios. So this was really developing our vulnerability assessment and understanding um, what what's at risk. So we pulled a lot of people together. It was a really um, uh, useful and and very helpful workshop although we came out of it being a little stunned because there's a lot of risks and there's a lot of um especially people vulnerable you can get to the next slide and what we did was we we looked at um about nine different uh sectors and we actually dug into who and what's at risk in these different sectors and you can see those everything from agriculture aquatic systems buildings business recreation and tourism, how will all these be affected um, down the line? And we, we had some small group conversations in each of those and tried to, again, understand the vulnerabilities and the risks involved there. We also had a group that looked at um, cultural considerations and social equity, and it, we started that as sort of a sector. And then really that became something larger than just one of these individual sectors, and we used that as some of our guiding principles. Um, so we pulled all this stuff together. We have now a vulnerability assessment to understand, um, again, who and what's at risk. And we, next slide. We, we brought that out to the community. Um, one of the ways we looked at it was trying to understand um, how hard it is to respond um, to the risks that climate change brings and what's, what are the biggest problems. And we developed these grids for each of those sectors that were on the previous slide and you know basically filled in the grid i wasn't going to show you all the words there but it's all in our vulnerability assessment that you can get online so next slide um we brought we brought those out and we 
we brought that to the community. So we tried to get a lot of community input, not just from our steering committee and the workshop, but also just some open houses and things so people could tell us what did we get wrong and what did we miss? And this is just an example of that. Next slide. Um, and then we've taken all that and actually we adjusted our vulnerability assessment and then we used that to kind of seed our second workshop, which was where we brought another group, mostly the same people, but some new folks, another 100, 100 or so folks together for a workshop where we figured out or started to look into what kind of actions and activities we would need to do to actually solve for um, for these risks that we identified. So what are the solutions that will help us be a more resilient community? And that's just some photos from that event, which was last May. And then we've taken all that information, and next slide, and we've tried to figure out to actually organize those. Um, from that workshop, we had over 300 different activities or actions that people identified as things we could do in our community and in our county that would make us more resilient to climate change. Everything from, again, those HEPA air filters, making those more available to folks, to planting trees, um, helping, helping our urban forest um, grow and, you know, dealing with the heat island effect that you might see in the summertime. So we're working through that now. This is again a, a program that's a planning process that's that's happening and we've gotten over our 300 of our actions down to about 88 that we're looking to prioritize those and again bring those out to the community, get public input, figure out what we've missed and try to um, bring that back because that will be the, the bulk of our um, climate adaptation plan. So the idea is to take this plan that we're developing together with the, the primer that explains the science, the vulnerability assessment that explains who and what's at risk, and then these proposed um, solutions, bring that all together with a implementation task force and really integrate it into all the other work that happens both within local government, but also within businesses and nonprofits and some of the other um, key uh, entities within Missoula and our county. So that's our plan and we should have that done by um, early 2020. Um, so, you know, I think what Missoula is trying to do is a kind of a combination of some things that we've identified need to happen. We're just doing them. People are planting trees. We're trying to think about wildfire smoke, um, thinking about the health and climate risk. And then we're also trying to plan for the for much longer trying to look out towards mid-century and figure out what it is that we need to do. Um, so I think maybe one more slide. Oh yeah, sorry, I, I forgot that this one was in here. This is our overall timeline. Um, this is available on our website right now. It's with, you can go to missoulaclimate.org and find it pretty readily, the whole process. And we'll be developing a website just for this um, resiliency planning effort. But you can see there's lots of stages, um, lots of steps, lots of, um, of value in, in reaching out to the community and getting buy-in for this work. Um, but we think it's been a really valuable process so far and we're looking forward to what we actually figure out to do, um, prioritizing our actions. And next slide. Yeah, okay, that's my last slide. And again, I'm happy to talk more at the end or um, at a future date with any folks that are interested in more planning efforts. That's great, thanks Amy. Um, now we'll, we'll um, go up north to Whitefish and Kate should be on the line. Kate, uh, yes. do you wanna, we can hear you. Do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi, um, my name is Kate McMahon. I am a planning consultant and I live in Whitefish. Um, I work with communities all around the state on a um, variety of planning issues. Um, but as a resident of Whitefish, um, I was um, appointed as a community volunteer um, to the city's climate action um, committee to help develop um, Whitefish's first climate action plan. Uh, and I'm also a board member for a nonprofit up here, um, Climate Smart Glacier Country. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about both of those um, today. And I'd like to thank you for inviting us uh, to participate. Um, Bozeman and Missoula are sort of hard acts to follow. We're relatively new to this. Um, but I'm going to um, give you an idea um, about what we've been doing in Whitefish. I'm going to be talking about the process to develop the plan, what some of the content recommendations are, and then some of the accomplishments um, that have happened um, in the years since um, we have adopted the plan. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide. 
the process that we used to develop this plan um, was actually involved a partnership um, with the school district and with the nonprofit Climate Smart Glacier Country. So Cl Climate Smart Glacier Country was very active in helping to write the plan. Um, and then there is a chapter with the Whitefish School District, um, which also looks at their operation. Um, Whitefish School District received a um, donation um, a few years ago to build a sustainability center um, to offer curriculum um, to the high school, um, elementary and middle schools on, on sustainability. So they had just received that funding. They were in the process of uh, developing that center. And so they were a major partner in this as well. Um, in January 2017, the city council passed a resolution to appoint the committee and charge them with drafting this plan. Um, soon thereafter, the United States uh, withdrew from the Paris um, Climate Agreement, um, and it was, was mentioned in the Bozeman presentation, um, 391 mayors from around the country um, agreed to uphold that um, uh, agreement, and Whitefish was one of the communities, Mayor Molefield from Whitefish. Um, the first step was to develop a greenhouse gas admission. I'll go over that in another slide. Um, but I also want to say that this process was um, a, a community um, involvement was very important to that. It included a survey, a number of forums, public hearings, news medias, um, happy hours. Uh, we just tried a lot of different ways to engage the community so this would reflect their vision and not just the committee's vision. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so the city of Whitefish, our first step was to develop a greenhouse gas emission. Um, this inventory was only for city operations. Um, we did not attempt to do a community-wide um, inventory at this point. That might be something that uh, we would do in the future, but just to start out, we focused on city operations. That was our charge from city council. We had an Energy Corps um, intern from um, NCAT in Butte that was here in Whitefish, um, and she helped um, go through all the um, utility bills from years past um, to put this together. And as you can see, as far as the um, city's um, operations, the biggest user or biggest greenhouse gas emission is our water and wastewater treatment systems, you know, falling by uh, buildings and then vehicle use. And we can go on to the next slide. Um, so after we did the greenhouse gas emission and developed that sort of baseline data, um, we started drafting the report. We had subcommittees um, within the committee that worked on different sections of the report. So I'm going to go through each section here. Um, and one of the key sections is forest and watersheds, um, which, um, again, the re uh, report was focused on reducing greenhouse emissions, but we also realized that adaptation um, was going to be a big part of this. Um, the entire city of Whitefish is in the wildland urban interface. Um, we are surrounded by um, forest service land, by state forest land, and by private forest land. Um, so we have um, concerns with just being a fire adapted, fire wise community. Um, if the uh, area up near the ski resort were to catch fire, uh, the city would be at threat uh, because the embers would actually blow down and, and our structures would be um, in, in that. So you saw the Paradise Fire in California um, was happening um, while we were in the process of um, adopting this plan. Um, so as unfortunate that, as that was, it was a reminder that our community is at high risk um, you know, from fires. So forests and watersheds was a key component of the plan. Um, in addition to just becoming a fire adapted community and trying to be pro proactive and avoiding fire in the Haskell ba Basin, a key strategy was to um, institute a conservation easement on private forest land um, that's directly north of the city. Um, this was important for a couple reasons. Um, the city's water supply comes from the watershed um, that is covered by Haskell Water Basin, so a forest fire would directly threaten our water supply. Um, and we wanted to protect that water supply also from potential development, because it is private forest land, and so it could be sold off for development. Um, so the city was um, able to um, 
purchase a conservation easement. Um, the funding came from, um, I'm sorry, that should say not USGS, but USFS um, grant. That was a typo on my part. So the United For um, US Forest Service um, provided a grant. The private landowner um, made a donation and by reducing um, some of the costs for it. And then a, um, a portion, a good portion of the cost to purchase that conservation easement came from the city's uh, resort tax uh, because uh, Whitefish is a meets the definition of a resort community um, in state statutes. We can voluntarily impose a resort tax. Um, we have had that tax in place for a number of years that has funded infrastructure. Um, so the city had a, a voter initiative to increase that tax for the purpose of purchasing this conservation easement. Um, that um, voter initiative passed 80% of the community supported a self-imposed tax um, to purchase that conservation easement. So we were able to do that to protect the watershed on the conservation easement also um, negotiated, um, you know, um, it, it's an active forest, a managed forest. So we were able to negotiate, um, you know, some forest management um, provisions there. Um, but as far as climate change, by protecting that area from develop, future development, um, it sequesters, it's a carbon sink. Um, so that became a huge um, strategy for us. And with that carbon sink, um, rather if we want to be a, um, a carbon neutral community, uh, rather than just reducing, reducing our emissions, we don't have to buy offsets because we've purchased this conservation easement that will allow us to be carbon neutral um, community. If you can go to the next one. Um, so the next um, section that we worked on was transportation and land use. Um, so this um, focused on the fleet management for the city, um, converting to electric vehicles and driving practices to reduce the emissions from the city's fleet. Um, but there was also a lot of focus on community-wide strategies um, that contribute um, you know, to greenhouse gas emissions. And a lot of that is coming from commuters. Um, Whitefish um, has a good portion of the population that commutes to work from Kalispell and Columbia Falls. Um, we, um, our housing prices are um, higher here because we are a resort community. So a lot of the workforce lives in surrounding communities because it's more affordable, but then they commute. So having that um, commuting contributes a lot to greenhouse gas emissions. So the strategies are um, to address that was better public transportation, um, but also um, energy efficient workforce housing. If we can develop more workforce housing in the community, then that means there's gonna be less people commuting. So workforce housing is actually a key um, component to our climate action plan. And so the city has a separate housing um, you know, plan, um, and they're in the process right now of developing um, some, some new developments um, that will be deed restricted um, and be made permanently um, affordable. Um, some other strategies included green infrastructure, especially the urban forests, and I think Bozeman and Missoula both talked about planting trees and the benefits of doing that. Um, you know, smart growth strategies such as walkability and reducing impervious um, surface, getting people out of cars, having less pavement, um, you know, those types of things that I think are probably in the other plans as well. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so buildings and energy, um, if you recall in our greenhouse, um, that pie chart I had on emissions, um, that following water and wastewater, buildings and energy was the next um, highest um, operation that contributed to greenhouse gas um, emissions. So um, since we have done the plan, the city has converted uh, most of its street lights to LED street lights, um, and that has um, you know, actually had um, a a big impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have a brand new city hall and our emergency operations center was built just 10 years ago. Um, and even though these are newer buildings, um, we still have, uh, they still had high energy usage. Um, part of that was because even when you design these buildings to lead standards, which um, they, they're not lead certified, but they use that as a guidance um, if you don't have the, the monitoring and the 
uh, using the correct software and certain operational practices, you're not going to realize those energy savings. So even though we have newer buildings that were designed with some energy efficient features, you have to continue. It's not just a one-off, oh, we've built the building, now we're gonna be fine. Um, you have to continually monitor and audit those operations um, to make sure that you're actually realizing those energy savings. Um, and then the city's um, uh, water treatment plan, um, like I said, the city gets its water from Haskell, it's, it's from the stream, um, Hellroaring Creek up in Haskell Basin. Um, and as the city, um, as that water goes to the water treatment plant, um, the city years ago had installed a um, hydro plant to generate electricity to operate um, the treatment plant. And it had, um, for various reasons, um, stop uh, operating um, and it was just sitting up there unused. So recently the city um, retrofitted that, um, started operating the hydro plant up at the water treatment plant, and it is now um, actually, we has paid for itself in three years, and we're actually selling um, energy back to the grid, and it's a revenue generator. So it, re it generates re um, the electricity for the water treatment facility, as well as generates um, some rev a revenue stream for the city. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And Kate, this is Paul. Just want to remind you, we have about 10 minutes left. So I know you have a few uh, slides to get through. So Yeah, I, I can get through these really quick. So water and wastewater, the city's in the process of designing a new wastewater for, uh, facility, um, which because we have to go through to a different type of treatment system is actually going to be more of an energy consumer than the old facility. So to offset that, the old lagoons are gonna be um, decommissioned and we're talking about putting a community solar facility in the old water um, you know, treatment lagoons to offset the um, elect, um, energy use at the, um, at the wastewater treatment plant. So that is one of the key um, things there. And also because we have a lot of illegal sump pumps, a lot of the water that we were treating, which uses a lot of energy, um, was coming from illegal um, sump pump hookups. So we're doing a better job of enforcing that. So there's some strategies like that that you wouldn't normally think of that actually had um, some major impacts on the city. So the final section in the report was on consumption, food, and waste. Um, you know, if we promote local foods, we'll have less transportation, less packaging, less waste, less methane gas at the landfill less consumption, less use of carbon um, intensive materials, um, you know, especially uh, plastics and things like that. So all of that was part of that as well. Um, so since we've, next slide, we adopted the plan um, in 2018, uh, the city made the Climate Action Committee a permanent committee to help implement the recommendations. Um, they have worked with the U.S. Department of Energy to become a Soul Smart designated uh, community, um, which means we've revised some of our land use um, codes to make solar um, more feasible and have done some training with the building inspectors to facilitate uh, more use of solar. Um, and on the transportation front, the city is going through a trans transit plan. Um, they are building a transfer station by the railroad. We have Amtrak here so people can transfer from Amtrak um, to the city bus or to the snow bus that uh, takes employees and, and skiers up to the mountain. The workforce housing projects um, I've mentioned, um, city is currently working with somebody on food composting pickup site. Um, we passed a water conservation ordinance this year and we continue to do wild um, fire workshops um, to help um, you know, make people more fire wise um, in their building practices. So just a few slides here on Climate Smart Glacier Country is the nonprofit that I'm also involved with that worked with the city on the plan. We've been in place since 2016. Um, and we cover our service areas, all of Flathead County, so not just Whitefish. So we have um, representatives from Glacier National Park on the board, um, Flathead County Electric on the board, um, and we're really trying to um, have the education and activities um, throughout all of Flathead County and not just focused um, on Whitefish. Um, if you can go to the next slide, the mission of the um, Climate smart glacier country is mitigation, adaptation, and education. Just trying to have the conversations on climate change in Flathead County 
Um, and so that the other communities and other people that want to take action on that, we can be a resource to help them with that. Um, the final slide is sort of what we do as a nonprofit. Um, we partnered on the Whitefish Climate Plan. We hold a lot of workshops and seminars, community conversations. Um, try to be an information clearinghouse. Um, we help organize Earth Day, um, do some grant writing, um, try to establish those partnerships. We work with Flathead County Health Department um, on a grant to deal with um, the impacts of wildfire smoke, um, which um, Missoula talked about a lot, and um, have given a, um, Climate Smart awards to businesses that are actually adopting sustainability practices. Um, in November here, in a couple weeks, we're going to be holding a symposium on plastics um, and how you can reduce in, um, uh, your use of plastics. And this has become very important uh, because due to China not taking, um, you know, plastic recyclables anymore, um, there is a very limited plastic recycling in the Flathead. So, um, there's a lot of interest in how we can reduce our use of plastics and that is what that workshop will focus on. So thank you. Thanks, Kate. We've got a few minutes for questions now and um, I posed some questions, uh, but I'm gonna assume since we have lots of folks in the room that uh, there might be some interest here. Again, what we're trying to do is just scale up all this great information across the state of Montana uh, from Ekalaka to Eureka and, and um, <laughs> And, and share the good information that's been, uh, and, and uh, the resources that have been generated. So questions for Natalie, Amy, or, or Kate? Please. First of all, it's wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. I just have a quick question. What resources, what resources are available in Fort County Health Department, the health departments? Great question. Um, and, um, Maybe I'll I'll turn it over to my colleagues who are working for the cities and um, and maybe their familiarity with the county resources or city resources. Amy, do you have anything uh, you want to add for that? Um, I think that I heard the question is for what resources are available to health departments. Is that or from health departments? Yeah, I mean or health departments. Was it from or yeah? In, in our experience, our health department here in Missoula is a city county um, a co effort. You know, they're, they're one entity for the city and the county partner together. Um, and they've basically done a couple things. They've provided their own staff time, their air quality specialists, and some of their other staff to help think about um, climate risks and what they can do about it. Um, we've partnered with them. They've had a small bit of money that they have been able to. Um, provide to Climate Smart at one point when we did some workshops and things. Um, but they didn't have a lot of funding to give, but they did were able to sort of allocate staff resources. And then they continue to look for grants, have written some, and um, looked for FEMA money and some, you know, it's just that sort of creative response that they've tried to bring into the issue. I'm not yeah. sure. If so this is Kate and um, Climate Smart um, Glacier Country actually partnered with the Flathead County um, Health Department to apply for a grant um, that would help them provide more resources. So what they are, what they do now is they're basically just um, an information clearinghouse. So if you call them up or go to their website, they can give you information on what air quality is like at any particular time of day. Um, they have links to DEQ and EPA um, that gives people information on how they can, what they can do when we have um, periods of poor air quality. Uh, but the grant that they applied for and that we helped them write was we're going to partner on them was actually to um, form a consortium of health departments between Flathead County, Lincoln County, um, Lake County and the tribes to um, form, uh, collaborate on developing more educational materials, but also working with health professionals in the communities to use them for outreach on air quality issues related to wildfire smoke. They did not get the grant, but as a result of us working with them on that, they are going through their health assessment process right now, and they're making um, air quality um, a priority area in their community health assessment. And then once they got, um, adopt that new plan later this year, we're hoping next year that that will um, help us apply for some funding so that they can do more. 
Thanks. Looks like we've got time for one or two more questions. Please. So it seems like this is a fantastic example of, of where climate uh, mitigation and adaptation really need to occur. When I say that, I mean more to get citizens in the thought process because, um, you know, it, it'll be regulation and things that act at a much the larger scale kinds of contributors to, to greenhouse gas emissions and to, to uh, adaptation kinds of strategies that may maybe come through agencies. But I think that, that this scale is so important and, has, and it's so important uh, based on, on just the, the psychology perhaps of, of dealing with climate change. But what I think, so what I'm curious about is, is there a plan then to really use what's been done in these communities and move that to more communities in Montana? I mean, I, I think this should be a central place for Climate Smart Montana, and I'm sure you have a, have a grand scheme there, but, but these are such great examples. It would be really nice to have that be the lead. Thanks for the question. Um, the, and that really is the whole intent of this, um, of this outreach effort, and I think that's why MSU Extension is so well poised to do this kind of work because we can connect uh, with our county agents all across the state um, and learn and hopefully try to scale up or scale across um, the, the lessons learned and, and, um, and the resources to, to, to share because uh, I'm sure there are things maybe you would have done differently, Natalie or Amy and Kate, um, and uh, sharing that with communities at, at different scales uh, um, is, 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 will just make the, the process more economical, more efficient as, as, we, as we do that. Comments from Amy or Kate? Yeah, just uh, maybe just toss in. Um, you know, at the same time that we're developing this Climate Smart Montana and Paul with Paul's leadership and and folks getting involved, there's also the Governor's Climate Solutions Council that has been meeting and and hopefully coming stemming from that planning that effort will be some recommendations for how to roll this out into all you know all of the communities in Montana. So kind of two efforts going on, and, and hopefully that will come to. Um, fruition and I'm on that one group of that governor's council so hopefully within the year that will early in 2020 that will come forward yeah and this is Kate and as I mentioned at the beginning my background is city planning and I work with communities um, especially tiny communities like Big Sandy and um, Chinook and everything on growth policies um, and that is a community, a smaller community like that may not be able to undertake a huge, you know, climate planning um, effort, but they are always updating their growth policies. They have to do that by state statutes. They're supposed to do it about every five years. And so that's a way for some of these smaller communities that might not um, have the resources to do the climate, a full climate plan, um, planning process, but they can incorporate some of these into their growth policy updates. Um, and even communities like Missoula or Bozeman that have done climate planning, there should be coordination between the growth policies and the climate action plans as well. So that's another way that you might get some of this planning done in some of these communities is through the growth policy process. Great. And I guess we have a comment online. Yeah, um, in Whitefish, actually, our, we had Energy Corps interns throughout the process, and they were, we would not have been able to do it without them. Um, so I would check with NCAT and um, about that program because they were a tremendous resource um, to the city of Whitefish in getting that plant done. Well, it looks like we're out of time. Please uh, check out the website for more information, and thanks so much for your interest. Have a great day.